Well, hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to welcome you to TNC's latest podcast on the topic of MPLS versus SD-WAN versus SASE. Uh, I'm John Waterhouse, CEO of TNC, and I'll be your host for the next 20 minutes. As I'm sure everyone joining knows, TNC is the UK's largest independent network and telecoms strategy and sourcing consultancy. We support over 280 major UK and multinational uh, organizations and help them to get the best possible commercial, technical, operational uh, and contractual results from all aspects of their network and telecom services. So joining us from TNC today to share his insights is our CTO, Craig Northveth. Craig, do you want to say hello to our listeners and viewers? Yeah, hi, John. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, looking forward to today's session. Fantastic. And it is a cracker. Um, I have to say this is probably my favorite topic of all. Um, and so I'm really excited about discussing it with you. So yeah, comparing MPLS, SD-WAN and SASE. So really uh, looking into this whole revolution, uh, which is sweeping the enterprise network market, what could be better? Um, so yeah, so let's sh let's set a bit of context. We'll get straight into it, Craig. So yeah, you know, uh, I, I mentioned this uh, technological revolution that's sweeping the market. This is something we've been tracking for a while now, good uh, two plus years. You know, I think the driving force behind this revolution is, uh, well, there's a number of factors, right? So uh, workload sh uh, shifting into the cloud, demand for enhanced network and application security, uh, virtualized infrastructure, network flexibility, vendor technology disruption. Um, but I think what we're, what we're finding is the pace of all of those changes and the complexity of those drivers and, uh, and, and the need to get it right is, is meaning many organizations are struggling to know how to move forwards, how to realize those benefits, what's real, what's vaporware, what's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, is it time to move away from MPLS? Does MPLS retain a role for the future? Is SD-WAN ready for prime time? What even is SASE? And, uh, you know, is it a realistic deployable solution yet? So, you know, I think in summary, we see a lot of excitement about the possibilities of these solutions, uh, but a lot of nervousness about how to go on the journey and, and, and of course, how to ensure you reach your, your target destination. But never fear because on today's podcast, we're going to break it all down for you, and talk through exactly that journey. And, and, and I think in particular, we're going to focus on, on uh, the four key transitional states, which, which you've been defining, Craig, uh, you know, and, and, and particularly, obviously, that's going to define the likely start point for most organizations. So let's, let's get straight into that. Let's look at our first topic. So, Craig, do you want to talk us through what those four transitional states are? are and and you know where most organizations are likely to be today yeah well john absolutely i think i think you touched upon a great point there you know we, we've been i guess what 15 years in, in in this business now um and i think you know if we look back maybe the first 10 of them years um we, there's limited selection in terms of availability of networks in the market you know it was kind of mpls or, or nothing should we say maybe Maybe a bit before that, there could have been a few other choices, but yeah, let's say let's 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 not pretend we're that old. <laughs> um, so so this would be think... our first podcast where we mention free relay, you know. <laughs> it could be, it could be. I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to go there. So let's yeah, let's just pretend that the the, the past is MPLS. Um, so yeah, I think I think if we start our journey there in terms of the transition, you know, a lot a lot of our customers back through the years of had kind of MPLS only networks. Um, we still do have some customers uh, that effectively opt for that model. Um, you know, typically this is a, a closed network. Um, it may have some sort of external gateways embedded into the network, or you may break out to sort of public internet services via the data center. Um, I think, you know, this type of environment typically will be provided by a um, single service provider. Um, you'd have some contractual guarantees around levels of service, quality of service. But typically it's quite a high cost solution and it probably lacks a bit of flexibility in terms of you know being able to consume high bandwidth being able to get to cloud services so we're starting to see some limitations around mpls being the only model um or being a preferential model okay so if we look at if we look at phase two um what we're seeing in terms of the revolution is this um, model of hybrid networks um so this is quite simply introdu introducing internet services into the mix at a local level um, so this is preferential because, you know, backhauling internet traffic or um, um, software as a service type of traffic 
across the backhaul MPLS network and breaking it out centrally is just not uh, an optimal route to take that traffic. Mm -hmm. So we started to see the introduction of local connectivity um, in line with the hybrid MPLS networks as well. That, that kind of leads us on to, I guess, more, more current day um, and where we're seeing the introduction of SD-WAN networks. So we're going to classify this as sort of a programmable network. So this is where we're starting to see abstraction of the overlay and the underlay. Um, so programmable network, and particularly kind of when we talk about SD-WAN, um, we can still run SD-WAN over MPLS networks, um, and we, we still do see customers effectively having MPLS in the mix in these programmable networks. But more often than not, and particularly as we look at international um, networks, the, the preferential um, underlay service is now internet. And we're starting to see a lot more, lot more services being delivered as a SD-WAN overlay with an internet underlay service. Um, the reason for this, I guess, is a couple of things. So the benefits of being able to have a selection of underlay providers. Um, so you've been able to kind of source your internet services either regionally or even on a local basis. So that's cost efficiency in doing that. The SD1 overlay, obviously, because it's abstracted from the underlay, it gives you a centralized um, control plane. Um, so that can be orchestrated from a policy perspective. Um, you can embed security into there. So there's a lot of advantages in moving to this model. Um, and I think as we, we go on in a second, John, talk about some of the, the factors around what phase you should opt for, we'll touch upon some of them benefits as well. And, and just thinking about that phase three, talking about the abstraction of the of, of the underlay and the overlay does that i get that at a technology level does that likely therefore also mean you've got a separate service provider are, are, are you buying your underlay from these service providers the overlay is somebody else or is that the same service provider what, what's the trend there so i think i think what this introduces is a, is a level of choice um so you can, if you wish, still have this as a single service provider. So we've seen a lot of the telcos, you know, trying to productize SD WAN services now and effectively embed them on their underlay services. Um, but you can also break it down. So that abstraction allows you, depending on the geography of your environment, depending on how you want to kind of operate the model, uh, operate the, the environment going forward, you can separate it out. So, you know, for instance, in a global network, you could have a single provider providing the management of that overlay environment, the SD1 infrastructure and the services supporting that. Then you could have multiple providers at an underlay, um, again, depending on depending on the geographies, depending on the density of sites and locations yep. and the number of circuits you've got. Obviously, there's a tipping point around where that comes, both sort of commercially feasible, but also operationally feasible to do that. Um, but we do see we do see both routes being taken. And presumably, therefore, what 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 you're getting there is you know, it's, it's that eternal trade-off we talk about of complexity versus cost versus performance. You know, so if you have multiple underlay providers, potentially that's cheaper. You know, it can go, be, yeah. look at, you know, lots of in-country providers, but it's complex to manage and orchestrate. And Yes. Yeah, okay. It, it, just, I know you, you, you're keen to get onto the, the sort of phase four and that potential sort of end state of the journey, but just going back to sort of what's driving... Uh, customers out of phase one into two and, and, and onwards into three. You talked about some factors. Uh, we, we've talked before about a mix of sort of what one might call push factors and pull factors. So the pull factors being positive benefits those organizations are seeking, like mm -hmm. like lower cost or greater flexibility or uh, more performant access to the cloud or whatever it is. Presumably, we're also seeing some push factors in there, dissatisfaction with telco performance and that sort of thing is, is that a factor yeah i think i think i think it is you know we're starting to see increasing demand um from from two two angles really so we're seeing depending again depending on the type of organization we see increasing demand either from the business to you know push more applications push more services be quicker to the market with certain things and that requires a level of agility in the network which you know, when we start looking at the kind of the, the MPLS and even hybrid networks to a certain extent, there's a limited limited um, level of flexibility in them networks to react quickly to things like bandwidth changes or security changes or policy changes or performance related changes. It's quite difficult to implement that quickly in their models, which is why organizations are starting to look at something that's far more agile that you can you know, relatively easily flex bandwidth up by adding additional services, you can manage performance more centrally you can get better visibility of what's happening you can mm. secure traffic easier so it's, it's around the kind of ease of management of the network where we're starting to see 
real drivers or organizations to deliver against the business objectives and demands, um, seeing that as a benefit. I think okay. the other side is customers as well. So again, you know, c customers now, um, you know, and, and this drives, I guess, behavior from a, an application point of view, from a business point of view, they want more efficiency. They want to be able to consume services, you know, from, from mobile devices, from apps. So again, that means more of a agile network environment to allow flexing up and flexing down of services more in line with, with demand. So whether it's mm. business demand or customer demand, it's just that level of agility that's required in the network now, which you know, people are starting to look away from the more traditional MPLS and hybrid networks into a more dynamic, you know, programmable network space and you know, in the future into more intelligent networks as well. Yeah. Oh, it's really interesting. And, and, and look, I'm not going to delay you for getting to that sort of phase four, <laughs> but, you know, I guess, I guess it's, yeah, uh, you, you know, you can, you can really sort of see, you know, it's how this, the, the terminology has changed that when these sort of intelligent networks and, and, and some sort of programmable networks and ultimately intelligent networks first started being kicked around and talked about, it was very much discussed as a cost saving objective but to be really we increasingly say hey look your know, cost you know well of course it's a factor but actually you can't operate your business with a phase one network anymore you've got to be looking into phase three and potentially even phase four to meet the demands that have been put on you by your your business stakeholders yeah and i think i think you know recent times as well you know the pandemic the, the pandemic has caused a slight different rethink around you know, even things like sd1 um, so, you know, in that kind of programmable network space, we were obviously starting to see a, a quite a big uptake in SD1. So a lot of the service providers have productized that now. It's pretty much a default mode of operation for um, for, for, for the, the RFP process. And, you know, we've seen that pretty, pretty much default, deep, common, commonplace as a proposal. The problem, I think, that the pandemic's introduced is that SD one's great if you're in the environment, if you're in the branch, if you sat behind the appliance. So you know it, it provides all of that performance and security and application and control and you know dynamic networking effectively. The problem is right now, and I think what we're seeing going forward is that we're more than likely to return to some kind of hybrid working environment. So therefore, that SD one infrastructure that sat in the branch or in the remote sites is not going to be as useful as it once may have thought to be, you know, back mm. before the pandemics when everybody was in the office. So that's kind of where the, 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 the thinking now is moving on to this more intelligent network model where, you know, SD1 probably sits within the intelligent network model, but you've also got the capability of accessing some of these security services and policy and performance services whilst you're off the network mm. you know, at home, for instance. So this is a model where we're starting to see you referred to it at the start, SASE, so Secure Access Service Edge. Yep. This is a model where we're starting to see some of them controls that you know traditionally would be sat on the edge of the network actually be elevated up into the cloud or the edge of the service provider network. Mm -hmm. So you know your last mile between you know, your device and the edge of the network effectively is commodity type services, but then you're consuming the security, the routing, the policy, the application performance at the edge of the network. So that's available for everybody, whether they're in the branch or whether they're working from home or from Costa or McDonald's or wherever, they're getting the same experience and they're getting that same level of security and performance whilst, whilst you know, from any, from any location. So this is where we're starting to see this, this concept of SASE come in. Um, and I think beyond that and, and looking at where the roadmap for this, this kind of environment is going, it's becoming much more um, almost like Pay as, you, pay as you go type model as well, mm. or, or network as a service model, if you like. So the ability, because you know, all this stuff is effectively virtualized at the edge of the cloud network or the telco network, it's moving into a similar model of cloud compute, where you yeah. spin up services, you create you know, functions and you create paths and bandwidths for when it's required, but then you tear it back down again when it's not being used. Mm. So it's a constant, it's almost like an infinite resource that can be reused all the time but it's not, it's not nailed up all the time. So yeah. you only use it when you need it. And then you start moving into this more sort of, yeah, consumption-based networking. Um, and, yeah. And, and presumably one of the things that, that underpins that, we've we've talked a lot both on podcasts and videos and breakfasts and, and but just, you know, just the two of us as well about sort of what the, the operating model is going to end up being for all of this. And, you know, I, I suppose one of the challenges with what you're describing is the traditional model of, 
human being logs into router starts coding uh you know updating configs to you know that that's not going to persist into this kind of intelligent network environment right because it's not that it can't be dynamic enough the the resource overhead is too great so presumably what you're also talking about there is starting to get to a level of automate or, or automation orchestration yeah, to support those those objectives yeah so this, it, it, it kind of becomes an intent based network then um so so intent driven by the intent drives the automation um which drives the creation of these functions it drives the creation of the the paths it drives the creation of the policies and security applied to them paths based on the intent of the the traffic if you like or the user so if the user is trying to consume a certain service that intent will drive the automation to build that service you know in, instantly almost um, create that service and once that service has been consumed tear it back down again so it's really yeah driving a high level of automation mm. um which you know is constantly learning as well so it's using ai it's using machine learning it's constantly kind of making itself more efficient cost effective um but yeah it does it does kind of ask a big question around well in the future you know, what what role do telcos play what role do service integrators play what role do just general you know internal operations seem playing in developing this kind of stuff yeah um because it is you know changing rapidly and to to, to, to meet the current demands of, of what we're seeing across the marketplace at the minute okay so that's really interesting great so i can see sort of how those four phases progress through from you know the you sort of start point for most organizations with a sort of fairly traditional looking you know, probably mpls network moving through sort of hybrid into sort of you know programmable and ultimately into a sort of intelligent network and, and, and is it that simple will an organization start at phase one and you know step into phase two and then phase three and phase four or or or, or you know will everyone end up at phase four might they you know and, and and is that pathway that linear it's not it's not linear no i think um you know i, th I think if we look if we look a few years back you know from from phase one to phase two was fairly linear most organizations went from them kind of closed mpls networks to hybrid networks i think just based on the points that i've made there now around some of these indirect factors like like covid for instance and the way that people are now working you know if we think about a future where we're in hybrid model then actually is there an opportunity to sort of almost leapfrog programmable network phase and go straight to intelligent networks move more into that sassy you know zero trust network architecture model where actually you know you, you're consuming network as a service rather than sort of building you know fairly it's, it's modern but it's still you know traditional infrastructure at a branch model um do you just move away from that completely and elevate everything into the cloud and consume it as a service i think we'll start seeing more of that in the coming in the coming years so these um, are, would it be fair to view these more as potential end states rather than stopping off points on a on a, on a journey yeah certainly 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 phase four intelligent networks i think it's it's a big step let's say from yeah. you know a closed mpls network to go to a let's move everything to the cloud and let's go zero trust and yeah you know let's 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 just do it overnight that's not going to happen um but it could be you know strategic um transitional phases that get you to that point and whether you go through you know hybrid to programmable to in intelligent or whether you go straight to programmable and then to intelligent or kind of a mix of them two together that's probably where we'll see most people end up um where they've got some integration or at least you know some 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 co-working between the programmable intelligent network models probably see most people end up around that space in yeah in years that's very interesting. And, and 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 what do you see as the strategic outlook? So if you if if you're looking two to three years out, how do you see this this changing? Um, so I think I think there's two there's two, two things, and we've touched upon we've touched upon the COVID piece. So you know we, the, the the external factors that will drive a change in in network strategy will be things like, yeah, we're not going to be having people in the office anymore, or we're not going to be having as many people in the office anymore. Yeah, That's obviously yeah, yeah. going to be quite a significant impact to the network that you provision within each of your locations. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll start seeing more, more organizations moving away from that sort of closed, secure, private network to maybe just an internet based network in the branch location. So they can have a more of a frictionless experience between the home environment and the work environment. 
Um, so, you know, opening it up, but then consuming everything from the cloud. So we'll see, I think we'll see a bit of that. And we're already starting to see, you know, a lot of organizations considering what their state strategies are post COVID and what ways of working will change in terms of when they're in the office, they might be hot disking or just using meeting locations. So we've seen, we've seen a lot of things there, which will be direct inputs or requirements into future network strategies. Mm -hmm. I think I think the second piece really then is around this this concept of you know almost like utility based networking or, or or network as a service. So you know starting to see the the last mile services and even some of the edge infrastructures become slightly more commoditized, um, and and a lot of the intelligence moving out um, closer to the closer to the core or closer to the cloud networks. So you know whether that's whether that's services that we start seeing through the big cloud vendors like um, like Amazon or Microsoft or Google potentially offering some of them services, I wouldn't be surprised at that. Um, but we'll also see the telcos, you know, trying to do a bit of a fight back, I think, um, because you know they're obviously concerned that they can see this coming, that a lot of their wires only services are going to become commodity services. We already know there's not a great deal of money in them, so they, they they've got the ideal infrastructures to be able to provide this virtualized edge. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing a lot more of that coming down their roadmaps and then starting to see productization of, of, of SASE services from them as well. And so I think that's, you know, strategically outlook. Um, some of the other things and, and just slightly going back to you know, some of the phase progression, there are obviously some direct factors as well. So some obvious things like um, compelling events like contract end dates. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, a contract's ending on MPLS, do we want to sign another five-year MPLS contract? Probably not. I think a lot of people will be quite nervous doing that right now um, because, you know, you'd be it's, it's a bit of a lock-in um, and you obviously need that level of agility and flexibility in the, the kind of unknown world that we're living in. So, yeah, I think that's 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 key, a key thing. But also cost challenges as well. Uh, of course, always. And, and presumably there's an element you know, as you say, with you know, you've got an MPLS contract coming to an end. Presumably, just because you know you picked a service provider five years ago because of their great MPLS solution, yeah, there's no guarantee that they're going to be the right people to take you on the next journey. You know, do you want a single supplier to do that? Might you want to break it up with the underlay overlay model we talked about earlier? Yeah. But you know, other service providers are going to be, you know, perhaps more progressed with their programmable intelligent network capabilities and so on so presumably that's also driving a, quite a bit of change it, it is and it's, it's back to one of the first points we made and this you, you, customers have got a choice now um i think you know back five ten years ago well, may, maybe not even that so you know maybe less than that the choice was fairly limited in mm. terms of technology and therefore in terms of suppliers as well um they've got a choice now around how they want to build architect their networks you know if they if they do want to do a slightly different operating model if they do want a higher level of um, agility or co-management if they do want some more control over certain aspects they have that choice now technology is allowed in that choice um, so I think they're yeah, thinking slightly differently around how do we how do we meet our requirements how do we get that agility how do we meet our business demand if it uh, how do we yeah provide flexibility if the business demand changes how do we ensure it's secure? Um, all of these things, there's a lot more choice and a lot more options available to deliver against the requirements rather than just saying, right, it's an MPLS network, we'll go yeah. to this, you know, one of five providers or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, really, really interesting stuff. Sadly, as always with these podcasts, they're fascinating. And then uh, and then I realize we're, we're basically running out of time. But, you know, just, just in terms of, you know, what very quickly, what we recommend our customers do do next with this i mean i think probably the the single biggest takeaway we, we would we would give any organization trying to decide what its future network journey is is give us a call let's talk about uh you know a really detailed strategy development process because probably as you say doing the same things over over again is, is almost certainly not a feasible outcome but navigating this very complex you know yeah you know, now you've got lots of choice but that you've also therefore yeah. got a lot of opportunity to you know to to uh, to make uh, suboptimal choices let's say or, or you know and, and you know obviously that creates a lot of risk given the criticality of the network to 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 your IT infrastructure so 
I, I guess that would be the key takeaway, right? Is you've really got to lean into that strategy development process. It, it absolutely is. I think we've, I don't know if we said this on a previous podcast, but you know, a strategy that was developed, a network strategy that was developed a year ago um, is, is highly likely to be relevant today just because of everything that's changed from a technology point of view, from a, a world point of view, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, everything, almost everything has changed. So yeah, it's, it's, it's looking at, well, do revisiting that, ensuring that you've got the requirements again, from a top down point of view, what the business trying to do, what you're looking at from a, an estates and facilities point of view. Um, how are our people going to be working in the future? What's the best way to consume services? Taking all of these sort of inputs and defining and, and aligning them to the choices that are available in the market and trying to build a roadmap that yeah, kind of paves the way to success, I guess, um, is you know, it's, it's what, what we do for lots of other customers. So we've got lots of insight and expertise in that space. But yeah, I would definitely recommend people um, think, think about that and consider if uh, what they've got that written down today is still relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Craig, fantastic as always, always fascinating, always interesting. And uh, but sadly, we're going to have to draw it to a close. Uh, our 20 minutes is up. But yeah, uh, always, always uh, grateful for your very interesting insights. And and uh, thank you everyone for listening and, and watching. Uh, please do let us know any questions you have about this or any other network and telecoms topic. You know, we love talking about it. Uh, you can get in touch through our website, networkcollective.co.uk or any of the usual social channels. And we look forward to talking with you again on our next podcast. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Bye.